Thank you all for coming today. Um, we'll get started on our next panel discussion. Um, the panel will be discussing recruiting, training, and retaining in today's economy. Uh, so we'll start off, uh, my name is uh, Sheree Gallardo, and I work for the Permian Basin Workforce Development Board. Uh, we'll start off today with uh, introductions from our panel and then go into a question and answer. And there'll be an opportunity at the end for uh, any audience questions. So uh, Dr. White, can you please start with your, uh, your name, title, organization, and a little bit about what you do at the organization? Uh, yes, my name is Dr. Gene A. White, Jr. I am the Dean of the School of Business and Industry at Odessa College um, here in Odessa. Um, in my area, we have a wide variety of different uh, disciplines there from culinary to auto diesel, uh, business professions to criminal justice, um, and a lot of things in between. So we deal a lot with um, the different businesses here and also in industry, and so we, I'm happy to be here today. My name is Dee Dee Arnson. I am the Partnerships and Employment Coordinator for SkillPoint Alliance. SkillPoint Alliance is located here in the Permian Basin. We offer free electrical and HVAC courses to our students. We use a rapid employment model, so this means that they are very, very quick classes. Electrical is only four weeks, and our HVAC is five. And I work very closely with our community employers to try and employ these students and make sure that they are supported throughout the entire process from registration clear through finding a job and beyond because once we bring them in we want to make sure that they have those resources that they need good morning i think it's still morning yes good morning my name is dr jennifer myers and i have the pleasure of serving as the associate vice president of workforce education at midland college I'm in my 12th year in higher ed. Um, actually, have had the pleasure to work both at Odessa College and at Midland College. Um, I currently oversee all of our adult education and literacy programming, all of our continuing education programming in our division of public service. Um, we are advocates for quick and uh, uh, affordable training for uh, our students, and uh, we want to be as responsive to the workforce as we can be, and we know that's a challenge right now, so. Thank you. So um, we know that small businesses make up a good, uh, large majority of our uh, businesses in the state of Texas, um, and but we also know in the Permian Basin, uh, we have the added challenge of having a really low unemployment rate. Um, so in your experience, um, what would you say uh, to our small businesses that uh, they should focus on in terms of recruitment and identifying talent for their businesses to grow? I'll go ahead and take that. One of the biggest um, places you want to start with is your community partners. Reach out to others who are in your situation who may have programs that they are offering. Um, we work very closely with the workforce um, office, but we're also very closely tied with both colleges here. So we make sure that we are trying to you know, reach those students where they're starting, but also for the employers you know, we're listening and trying to help them understand, okay, well, what, what do you really need? What are you looking for specifically? And then how can we hook you up with the right people? So I, I think as a small business owner, you're definitely going to want to analyze what your needs are and then do look for those partners who may be able to help you. And just to piggyback on that as well, is that you have a need. You're analyzing those different needs well one of our goals is to be able to place those students if we talk midland college odessa college we're wanting to put these students 
into jobs when they leave here. We're not just concerned with how many we enroll or how many we have at our school at that time. We want to know that they're having a, a high value, a high wage job, something that they can sustain their families and then in a lot of cases change their lives and their generations for generations to come because of what they've done and the foundation that they've built. So you have that need, connect with those institutions, connect with the schools because we have people in these particular areas that we're training to go into your businesses, to be able to go into your fields and to um, do good work. And I would add to um, each of the colleges our Midland College does, and I know Odessa College does, but many colleges in your areas have um, career centers because the college's goal is, as Dr. White said, to get the students employed. So if you have a need um, and you haven't explored the career centers on the campuses of your colleges, please reach out to them and they will help connect students to available job openings in your companies. Um, I also, uh, am fortunate to have workforce solutions on the Midland College campus and we are always working with them to connect our adult education and CE students to high wage high demand jobs in the community and so if you haven't tapped into those two resources please do and if you don't know who to reach out to at your local college get on the website look up the directory and email somebody they'll get you to the right person and they'll make sure that they connect you to the people who can help you the best thank you well, what impact do you believe the current economic environment has on expectations employees have from their employers mm -hmm. and how should leaders or businesses adjust their recruitment approaches accordingly I can I I can weigh in on that a little bit and I, I wouldn't I would be interested in what my colleagues have to say as well because <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's more than just the economic landscape that impacts what people are looking for um, these days especially with the generational differences in the workforce now um, each generation I think is looking for something different um, as somebody who hires regularly as well, uh, we hear a lot about you know um, work work life balance. Um, we hear a lot about what uh, perks outside of basically of the basic salary can the employer offer. And I know this is more difficult for small businesses. And in this economic landscape, because Midland and Odessa essentially have the lowest unemployment in the state right now, people who want a job probably have a job. And so what you what how do you make yourself unique and stand out in, to potential uh, uh, employees um, other than just a base salary? What other perks can you provide or what other uh, opportunities can you provide for family and, and for that individual? Yeah, and I think when we look at post uh, pandemic, we think about the recovery that we've had to do from that. The, look at the, these employees are seeking uh, greater financial stability. They want uh, flexibility um, and then also support for their mental well-being. So as employers, you want to make sure that you're offering uh, competitive compensation packages. Um, these include benefits like your mental health uh, programs. They also are looking for transparency and communication. So what I've seen when we talk to different employers around the Permian Basin is that those who have the most retention when it comes to their employees are those who have a very transparent culture. It is a one where they're making it feel like family. And so as a small business, if you can develop what that culture looks like, um, you can grow not only your employees that you have, but you also recruit those into that culture and you make it one that is those that you can actually stay around for a long time because they feel that stability. Um, coming from outside of the state of Texas, I wasn't born here. I just mm -hmm. the the cost of living here is a, is just a, it's a lot more than where it mm -hmm. was in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And so, for me as an employee, I came into Odessa College and felt like a, it was a family for me. And so, I think understanding that, and then also understanding that where we are right now, understanding the generational differences 
of employees in the workplace. You, the way that you communicate with somebody in Generation X won't be the same as somebody that you communicate with a, uh, as a millennial or, or Gen Alpha. So their expectations are different. Um, and then the way that you talk to them will be different. You have to say it in a different way. So understanding those things is another way to make sure that you're uh, retaining these valuable employees. The employees are also going to want to know, how are you going to treat them during the off season? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where I work closely with you know, two, two programs, electrical and the HVAC, HVAC is, is really winding down right now. And so how are they going to be treating you as the employee knowing that you may get laid off for the winter months? You know, what, what are they going to do? You know, being able to provide for your employees during the downtimes, that's what they're going to be looking for. I, I've got several different companies that I work with specifically that plan for those times and they keep their employees on during the slow times. With the understanding though that when we get to busy times, which is you know pretty much the rest of the year, um, here if you're an HVAC person, that you're gonna put in extra hours. So, you know, understanding that there is going to be that balance, but also understanding as the employee that, hey, you know what, they're going to take care of me. Also, what training are you going to give them? Because it's, it's not just good to hire them on anymore. They want to know how can they grow with your company? Are they just going to be a technician? Are they just going to be that employee? Do they have a chance to advance? Because that's what they're looking for. They don't want to stay stagnant anymore. They want to keep moving forward. Thank you. Um, what are some of the trends that you're personally seeing that would help businesses de develop their pipeline, their talent pipeline? So a lot, I've seen a lot more people, or businesses are investing in their current uh, they're building a bench is what we talk what I talk about for a sports analogy. Um, so they're, they're, they realize that some of their leadership in their company may be about to retire, uh, may be growing and outgrowing the company and moving on. And so how do they build internal? Um, how do they build up their internal bench for promotions? And so I think um, piggybacking on what Dee Dee said, how do you keep them engaged with ongoing training and development? Um, how do you invest in your, your known commodity as your current employees? Um, all that being said, I do think it's important to uh, keep, an, keep a healthy mixture of outside employment too so that you get a nice balance of people coming in with fresh ideas. Um, but I think, uh, again, it's piggybacking too on Dr. White. What does each generation want? That's, it, it's more than just a base salary now. Yes, salary is important and the cost of living in Permian Basin is is a little bit higher than other places, um, and so uh, the base salary is important. But what are those other things? Culture, um, engagement with your coworkers. What does that look like? And I think that that's important as well. Another thing to look at also is, you know, they want to look at your values and your values. If they don't match up with theirs, they don't want to come and work with you. And you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but some of our, our newer generations, um, that's more important than a paycheck. And if, if you don't have the same beliefs that they do, they're going to pass. And so trying to help understand, you know, okay, well, how do we find that, that middle ground? And helping the employee understand, okay, look, I, I do support some of these causes. I do support some of these things, but I also run a business too. And you know, just, just trying to, like I said, find that good balance between the two. Thank you. That's a good segue into um, training and development. So uh, what does training have to uh, do in helping businesses recruit and retain employees? How, how important is that um, in long-term retention? I mean, as an employee and an employer, even as an instructor, a former teacher, you want your classroom and thus your employees to be engaged. And when they're engaged, they're thinking critically about 
your small business. They're thinking critically about the problems. They're problem solving. They're part of the team culture. Um, an engaged uh, employee is an employee that you're, you know, is is benefiting the company. And so I think when there are opportunities to diversify skill sets, um, to learn about new techniques or new uh, processes in a, in any given field. Um, uh, that opportunity should be seized upon by the employer. Um, and I would, and it's not always incumbent upon the employer. And I think w we need to do a better job of this in, in higher ed about marketing what we can do for employers and really getting out and getting into those businesses and saying, hey, I'm Dr. Myers, I work at Midland College. You don't have to train your own employees. We can do customized training for you. And did you know that the state of Texas has skills development fund grants and, and small business uh, development grants to help? Uh, so you don't have to pay for the training. The state of Texas will pay for the training. Um, and we have, we have a lot of talent at the colleges that know different processes. As Dr. White said, we are, they have welding, they have culinary. Most colleges have a lot of these similar programs, so they have instructors in place who can teach those skills to your workforce. And so we don't do enough, a good enough job in higher ed saying, hey, here's what, here's what higher ed can do for y'all. And it doesn't have to be a two-year degree. It doesn't have to be a six-month degree. It can be a 40-hour training. It can be an eight-hour training. And so I think um, when you offer that type of diversity of education and opportunity to your workforce, that keeps them engaged and that, that helps to retain them in their current positions. And you also think about the word community when we look at a community college. Like mm -hmm. this is, this is, these are your colleges, these are your institutions that you have the opportunity to help shape what these students learn when they get ready to come and leave our institutions and go, or mm -hmm. your institutions and go back into your workforce. So as a small business owner, use your resources. We, especially in the career technical education, we are having advisory committee meetings every mm -hmm. semester, basically. So we're wanting to talk to you. We're wanting to talk to our business owners, our um, executives, our management in these different industries because we want to know what you need. What are the skills that you're looking for? What are the the knowledge? What is the knowledge that you want them to obtain so that they can be ready to go out and hit the ground running when they hit your um, institutions? Mm -hmm. So if you are a part of those um, committees, you can help us to shape the curriculum as we are teaching the individuals in these classes. So you have a lot of skin in the game that you could be putting in so that when you're ready to rock and roll, they're ready to rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Also take advantage of the trainings that are offered by your distributors mm -hmm. because they're wanting to introduce new products to you. Let them train your workforce and most of the time you can get that at, at no cost to your business, but do take advantage of those. They are available. Thank you. So we, we've talked about um, the student development. We've talked about training. Um, and some of our small businesses are uh, owned by tradesmen. Um, Didi, do you find that we have an aging trade workforce? And um, what are you seeing in, in terms of uh, Skill Point Alliance and connecting the trades to uh, jobs? Well, right now, uh, we're, we're looking at 50% of our tradesmen are at retirement age. They are tired, they are ready to move on and give the skills to the next generation. And trying to find people who are willing to step in and do some of these trades, you know, is, is a really important thing to do. Um, it, it's definitely a struggle um, to try and, and, you know, do this before we end up with our skilled tradesmen who are no longer in the business. Because they will retire and then we're going to be losing that on the job training opportunities. So, trying to go ahead and reach those students early on. 
okay, we're, we're going to be approaching our, our high school students. How do we convince them that, you know what, a trade is a good thing to go into? Mm -hmm. A trade is no longer, you know, that thing that, that you do because you can't get into college. A trade is a great thing. A, a trade, we need to be sharing with our community, with our students, that learning those skills is not going to go away. You can't have a computer come in and, and fix your air conditioning. You can't have a robot come in and, and fix your electricity. The robot's not going to go fix your car. We've got to have people in place who are able to do that. And so by targeting them while they're still in, in high school, working very closely with our community colleges to offer programs such as what we do, um, the, the um, certificate programs that are offered through the college, the associate's degrees that are offered through the college, we need to be taking advantage of those. And not everyone is is really set out to go to college. I, I come from a family that my husband and two sons, um, they all work in, in the trades. They have not gone to college. They don't plan to go to college. And that's okay because they're able to support our family in a way that um, makes all of us comfortable. We are not the only family out there like that. And so we're trying to reach out to our community partners and say, hey, look, We've got these programs, access them, all right? Talk to the colleges. How can we get more of our students to come in and do these programs? And I think, Didi, just to, to piggyback on that, is that we have to do a, a better job, I guess, of marketing or making that look attractive. I know as a teenager, I played golf with a, a dentist in a tournament, and, and I know he made a ton of money. He drove a nice Jaguar. And, <laughs> I, I, I want a Jaguar, but mm -hmm. playing golf with this man, he told me that if he could go back and do it again, he would probably be a plumber versus a dentist. <laughs> because when you have plumbing issues, you're not going to call that dentist to come and fix it at 3 o'clock in the morning on a mm -hmm. Saturday night. You're going to call a plumber to come out and do it. And so there, the, these trades are essential to just our quality of life. And I think if we can figure out how we make that more attractive, mm -hmm. then we can have these younger students who, instead of at six years old saying, hey, I want to be a doctor, I want to be the president, I want to be a lawyer, because those, that's what sounds attractive, mm -hmm. but how do we make the, the mm -hmm. plumber or mm -hmm. the HVAC, because they enjoy this air conditioning at 106 degree weather here in West Texas. 140 <laughs> degree attic. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? So they enjoy that, but how do we make that attractive? Because that's yeah. what people need. And I would advocate to, as someone who's been in workforce education for a few years now, we need to change the verbiage from blue collar. Mm. We need to change the verbiage from trades. Uh, we need to tell a different story about those careers because they're careers. And when you put the salary that a plumber makes up to next to the salary of a dentist, they're probably pretty similar. Right. Uh, <laughs> And nobody likes going to the dentist, really. I mean, <laughs> if you think about it, it's something you got to do, but you don't like it. Um, and so I just think, you know, it's it's also in how we tell this the narrative. Um, and it's also educating parents, I think. You know, students still get a lot of pressure from parents to follow very traditional academic pathways. There's nothing wrong with that. I did that. Um, <clears throat> but I also have her brother who graduated from Odessa's Odessa College's automation program, and at one point in time was making more money than me. So who who took the better you know path there? That can be debatable. We debated around Thanksgiving and Christmas, but um, <laughs> you know you could still uh, you could still make a great living. You can support your family. You can change your family's future, uh, and it it doesn't have to be a four year, eight year pathway of study. Um, it can be a, a six-month welding certificate. It can be a five-week plumbing class that you take. Um, every, everyone's journey looks different, and that's okay, and that's what we need to normalize uh, as we talk about careers instead of a white-collar versus a blue-collar trade. I think one of the first places we need to talk, we need to start is in our schools. Mm -hmm. We are so hung up on the standardized testing mm -hmm. in our schools mm -hmm. right now and the college preparation we are missing the target for what the industry really needs. 
And when we change that narrative to, you know what, you choose your career and your career path is yours and it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it, as soon as we can do that, instead of trying to put everybody in the same little box, I think we're gonna see much better success. And for you as small business owners, you're gonna be able to find much better and um, more long-term employees by doing something like that. Thank you. With the rapid pace of technical, sorry, technological advancements and evolving job roles, how do you design and implement training programs mm -hmm. that keep mm -hmm. employees' skills relevant? Mm -hmm. I would advocate at that point heavily for continuing education. Uh, community college curriculum on the credit side of the house can pivot pretty quickly, but continuing education pathways and programs can pivot even quicker. Um, they typically don't have the same type of uh, accrediting standards to meet on certain programs. Um, I, I think one of the challenges to that is finding instructors who are qualified to teach the best, the latest, the greatest technology. And so, um, uh, which is why I would, again, reemphasize the importance of, um, of, of continuing education training. We can pivot quickly, we can implement quickly um, based upon a company's needs and what they tell us they need like six months ago. But let's also not discount the fact that we are still going to need people who know how to use mm -hmm. the old technology. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to have a good mix of the two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in order for you to stay successful and relevant in this society, you're going to have to be able to do both. Because, for instance, a hospital or a university, college, schools, church, I mean, they don't have the money to go and completely redo their plumbing system, to completely redo their their electrical system or their HVAC system. So you're gonna to have to have someone who can still work with the old and make it work. New construction, a little bit easier to add, you know, the latest technology there. So you're gonna you're gonna to wanna to be able to do both. Yeah, and I think that if you <clears throat> as a business owner, if you can in a culture of continuous learning into your environment, then that learning and development will just be something that always happens. Making sure that, like Didi said, you have that can, you have individuals who can do both. So cross training, making sure that they mm -hmm. spread out their knowledge across different uh, facets of your organization will allow them to be able to adapt better to. Um, be able to do other things when the need comes for your actual, uh, for your business as well. And then also make sure that you're levering modern tools. So as the technology grows and AI is not going away, you know, so we're still going to have the, the, the old systems, but you want to have these new modern tools that may help these older systems, but you want to be able to be cross-trained and, and, and bring in those, those fresh, faces, fresh ideas that can actually help to make everything run a little more efficient in it. So embracing what the technology does versus fighting it is a better <laughs> option uh, to help your business grow if that's what you want your small business to do. Thank you. Uh, how can organizations effectively train their employees to adapt to new technology and industry changes? especially in the sectors where technological advances are rapid. So that's kind of, uh, you know, what uh, you've been talking about in technology. How do we handle the change as they come and inc uh, include that in our training and development of our employees? As I said earlier, taking advantage of the trainings that your distributors offer to you on their latest products. Um, there's a, a really cool term that I learned um, here recently. It's called the Internet of Things. IoT is huge. It, it's how your phone talks to your, your HVAC system, your, your thermostat at home. How it can actually go in there and it can um, regulate your system to make it more efficient. 
Um, we're going to have to start really taking a look at things like that, not only to save, our, save ourselves money, because I mean, hey, it's, it's hot here, we need our, our AC working all the time, um, but we need to do it more, effect, more effectively and more efficiently, because that's costing us dollars when it's not. And so keeping up with the latest technology is gonna be a, a huge benefit for you as a small business. And you don't have to implement it all at one time. You know, maybe you do, you know, this year I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on this one. Um, I'm going to focus on buying these special tools. Um, I know that, for instance, I talked to an employer uh, about a, a new type of um, the way that they're, they're capping their, their lines with the coolants. So they're not welding anymore. They're actually using, um, using special tools that go in and, and they have little rubber seals that they put on there because of the type of gases that they're using and they're much more flammable. So staying current with that, not everyone on their staff is going to be able to afford these new tools. So they're gonna have a few who are going to do that, but not all of them. And eventually they'll work their way up to where everyone is, has those resources and, and that'll be great. But Doing what you can little by little and staying current is going to be a huge help to your business and continue to grow. And depending on what the business is and, and what industry that, or what sector that you're in, there are times where things age out. Like you can't, you can't buy what you've been using for years. You have to get the newest equipment and sometimes even if you as the owner, as the leader, are not as um, up to date when it comes to the technology itself, it may be something as simple as looking at a person who handles data analytics mm -hmm. that can look at, because all of this, these new machines, they, they are sending data somewhere. You're able to collect and use that data to actually help things run more efficient. If you were to buy a piece of equipment, even though it may cost you a little bit more on the front end, you buy this equipment that is going to be able to give you data and help you save energy, save money, dollars that you don't have to pay into electricity or heat, heating air, water, those utilities. If you could buy this equipment that's going to help you, now you can also employ a data analytics person mm -hmm. that can actually take a look at the data and see what else can we do mm -hmm. to actually save money here that's going to help us on our bottom line here. And so I, I think about in our previous mm -hmm. panel when we talk about looking at the, the balance sheets. Well, that is another thing that's going to help your balance sheet because you're going to be saving money on expenses when you're not having to pay as much because of just putting into a, a data, analytics per, data analytics person into the mix. And just to put this into context, they're estimating that products like this are going to be bringing in $11.1 .1 trillion to the U.S. economy by 2026. So as a small business owner, you're definitely going to want to keep up with the latest trends and what's going on and try and implement the best that you can. Because I would love for all of you to have a part of that $11.1 <laughs> trillion. Wouldn't we all? Yes. Thank you. How can organizations effectively train? Oh, no, I'm sorry. We already went over that. <laughs> How can leaders balance the need for uh, immediate results with the long-term investment in employees' uh, development and well-being? I think we go back to investing in your current workforce um, in, in retention and in training of the, the staff or employees that you currently have um, because that is a long-term investment in the success of your company. Um, and hopefully those employees are trained well enough to get those immediate gains that you need to see um, as part of your business success. Um, I, I also think that looking, you know, playing to your employee strengths. When, when you hire someone and you start to work with them, you see, you start to see where, where those strengths are and where, not only that, but where are the passions that they have for learning uh, new new things. What are they really good at? What's their niche? 
um, and start leveraging that in your company and nurture that. And nurturing that can look like ongoing professional development, can look like a, a two-week training course. Um, grow and nurture that because that passion is what is making them content in their work. It is what is bringing fulfillment to them in their career. And so when you're playing to those strengths, people will be successful. And that investment that you put into them will not only make your short-term goals achievable, but also your, your long-term goals as well. And remember, they're the face of your company. And if they're not, if they're not happy, then you know that that's going to show and when they go and and work with your customers you want them to you know be able to convince that that new customer hey look this is the best place ever to work this is why you want us to be the person who's coming in and, and doing this for you we you want us to be the one who's selling you this product so investing in them is a huge benefit to yourself and it will make your bottom line grow and you also want to make sure that your um, immediate goals they, and your long-term development goals, that they align with the strategic initiatives and the strategic objectives of the company. So what is it that your company is trying to do? And then from that point, you want to set those clear uh, short-term goals that will give you the immediate results, but then also develop the strategy where your, your business um, – your resources are split between, okay, some of these allocate, our resources are allocated towards our long-term goals, some of these uh, resources are allocated towards our short-term goals. And as you're doing that, you're going to get the most bang for your buck by mm -hmm. uh, making sure that you're aligned. But it, it all goes into strategically prioritizing what you are um, having your employees to actually do. Thank you. What are the key factors you consider when developing retention strategies and how would you measure their effectiveness? Who wrote that question? That's a great question. It is a good question. <laughs> that was not my question. <laughs> that was Dr. White, he's down there. Nope. No? Okay. Um, I think you look at your existing uh, employees um, Again, I think you've got to play to their strengths. Um, you've got to find out what, again, what is motivating them intrinsically outside of a salary. I know we all have bills to pay and we all enjoy getting paid every month or whenever that is, but what is intrinsically motivating them and what is their buy-in into the company? And I guess, you know, what what is their why for being where they're at? Um, if you can tap into that and kind of fan the flame of that passion, I think you're making a good investment in retention. Um, things are gonna happen in people's lives that are out of their control and they may have to move for family or whatever, but if those intrinsic needs are being met, um, you know, high, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's, that investment will always pay off in my opinion. Do you know who their family is? Mm -hmm. You know, can you ask about, you know, hey, how, how was your kids, you know, soccer game this weekend? You know, paying attention to the little things might seem, you know, a little bit silly, but it does make a huge difference. I, I like knowing that, you know, my boss is going to come and ask me about, you know, what I did for the weekend or, you know, but knowing, knowing them, knowing their lives makes them seem like they are more part of your family. And because your business is your family, you want them to be a, a key part of it. And... Employee well-being is really what we talk about there, you know, and if you are investing in your employees well-being It's not just a long-term strategy. It actually will help to give immediate results um, And when a employee feels like they belong they feel like they're a family They feel like they're in a culture where we're all in then they will continue to put out good work one of the things that I always do in a new situation when I come in as a leader is I ask my team members to fill out this form and it, um, I originally saw it from the Ohio State uh, University and it was a form that says how I wanna be coached. So I give that 
as a assignment to each one of my team members. And it basically asks you, well, what are the three things that I need from my coach? What motivates me? What do I see myself in two years? And they literally go through this series of questions. And as a homework assignment, they turn those back in to me. And then now, as a leader, I can go in and I review those. Um, we don't have to necessarily have a conversation about it, but uh, six months down the line when a situation comes up or if they say that they have a tendency to overwork themselves, they volunteer for everything, then I can say, hey, you might need to not volunteer for this one. Let this other person take this because now I can go back and say, remember what you put in that how I want to be coach document? Because that was a way for me to let them tell me who they are and who they want to be. And then you update that on a yearly basis because people's values change, their priorities change, and then constantly they're letting me know who they are so I can be a better coach for them. And I think as a small business owner, getting to know your people, having that conversation and wanting to care about their well-being and doing it is a great way to retain your employees. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes left and we want to know if there's any questions from our audience. We'll be willing to take those questions now. <laughs> we have a question here. Up front. Hi, my name is uh, Todd Brown with Brown's Barbecue. I just want to ask, what do you see in the uh, employees uh, today as far as what companies are doing to uh, encourage them for like team building events? Do you do you see that being a common thing for employers that are doing for the employees to be able to retain them? I've, in the past, I've seen a lot of that, me personally. I, I've done it. Um, it depends on kind of the, the, the sector in itself. I, for me, when I worked retail, we did team builders all the time. And then I think that goes back to kind of knowing your employees themselves. So being able to get off site to be able to show, again, how that you care about them. It doesn't, in some cases, you can use, it depends on how you use your team builder, because a team builder can be something where it's, oh, well, we're, we're, we're going to get off site and then we're going to talk about work. I don't necessarily really consider that. I call that an off site work meeting. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, that's not necessarily a team builder, but I like retreats where we go out and we go to Synergy and we play laser tag, if that's what it is, or you do bowling. And maybe you have a brief meeting right before you, and you just talk about, it's, it's a celebration, it's the things of here's what we've accomplished, here's where we want to go. It can be vision casting, but not drawn out. It's something that's brief and short, but we are coming together and we are building as a team and getting to know each other better as a team versus, hey, so let's go have a drive meeting that is not on at work, but it's off campus. And then we say it's a retreat. So, But team building does work if you're strategic and intentional about how you do it. This may not work for you very well just because you do own a restaurant, but I was going to say a lot of what we do is we have staff lunches. And uh -huh. you don't talk work. You just do a staff mm -hmm. lunch. Everybody sits around. You know, you might be sharing food, but it gives you a chance to bond and, you know, talk about the, the things that you can't talk about when you're so busy at, you know, mm -hmm. at your, your normal work hours. And I think what you call it is important. I, I know I have employees, if they heard team building, they'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> But if you call it something else, uh, you know, and I have teams that work really well together and they just gel and uh, they don't need team building. And so I think it's knowing to the, the people on a certain in a certain division or area, um, you know, they may be good to go. And you you're you're always you know, they're good. But this other team needs some tweaking. And I think, yeah, I think what you call it matters because team building may not be the right thing, depending on the perceptions of the people in that group. Hi. 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 My name is Richard. I own Bear Claw Knife and Shear over in Midland. Um, one of the big problems we have when we hire somebody new, and fortunately we don't have to do that very often, our retention program is very effective, but when we do hire somebody new and they're right out of high school, or right out of college, there's, there's really two areas we have a serious problem with. One of them is communication skills, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like they have none, mm -hmm. and the other is problem solving. Mm -hmm. How do we convey to the education 
people out there, high schools, colleges, that these are two areas that are critical for us when we're trying to hire someone, even, even just in retail. Uh, how do we improve those areas in education? I know you come from academia. Yeah. What we're seeing is troubling. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, no, please. I agree. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So back to those advisory committee meetings, we've heard that. And so I can tell you how at Odessa College what we've actually started doing. And there is a table out there, not a promotion, but there's a table out there and there's a, a gentleman there, Aaron Trimble, who works with our Keith Career Transfer Center. So Dr. Um, Myers talked about the career centers that we actually have. and so. At this Keith Career Transfer Center, we go over their resumes. We go over um, talk, having conversations. We do mock interviews, those types of things there, too. But we've heard that some of these uh, students that are coming out don't have basic skills, like being able how to answer a phone, how to send an email, you know, and how to make a phone call, those types of things. And so that's what we've started to kind of focus in, especially in our business professions mm -hmm. uh, department that falls underneath me, we're starting mm -hmm. to make sure that we're putting a little bit more emphasis on those types of things. And then we're pulling in Keith Career Transfer Center. They're having conversations with them. And then if they need extra help with those things, we're making it a point to try to change that narrative because it's those basic things that we've been seeing from some of our business owners that said, hey, we just need this. I mean, this is great, but can they answer a phone when they say when I call in to say that hey I, and get them to the right place? Mm -hmm. Those are the things. Or learning how to talk and not do this, you know. That would be. <laughs> they don't make them like me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a limit to the powers of higher education. <laughs> no, I think, um, yeah, I think, so in adult education, for example, we're required because we're grant funded to provide those skill sets. Mm -hmm. And I, those students are hungry for knowledge and they take to that quickly. They love it. Um, I think it's going to take embedding those skills. Hey, let me teach you how to pipe weld, but also here's how you answer a phone. Here's how you fill out a ticket. Um, it, it's going to take an embedding of those skills in the hard skill training to get those. And I know, so, I know we're getting away from the term soft skills, but every advisory committee I sit in, just like Dr. White and probably DD2, is we can't get these people to take their earbuds out. We can't get these people to put their phone down. Um, and so it's just, you've, it's, you've got to be shown, you've got to be shown. And we need to embed that in the hard skill training that we do. And that, that's something that I do in my trainings because I also do, uh, work, I do workshops for our students mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Um, interview skills, I do, um, their resumes and things that I, that I share with them are, you know, really some of those soft skills that they are missing, you know? I, I don't I don't want you to you know go to your interview and all you do is sit there on your phone. No, this is what you're going to be doing because when you get to the job, this is what they expect. You're not going to be on your phone, and if you think that's what it is, this is the wrong field for you. I've but, joked. I'm sorry. I've joked, and I may still do it about creating an adulting 101 yes. continuing education class where they're taught, you know these skills um, and I think we start it with our dual credit students because they're in high school and yes. they're a captive audience um, and, and we're still working on that. So more to come on that. Thank you so much everyone for uh, being in attendance. Thank you to our panelists. Of course. Uh, this will conclude our, our panel session. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you.